I grew up in West London, uh, in Chiswick, and in Chiswick High Road there was a garage called the Checkered Flag. I used to go up there on my bicycle and look at all these wonderful cars that were in the showroom, Lotus 11s, uh, all kinds of sports cars, including racing cars called Geminis that the Checker flag were building for Formula Junior. I eventually got a Saturday job washing cars uh, just to get close to these machines that I was fascinated in. And one day they asked me if I'd like to go to a race meeting and Chaz Beatty, who built the Geminis for the, the, the Checkered Flag, drove me to Brands Hatch in the transporter. It was one of those eureka moments. I got out of the truck into the paddock at Brands Hatch. There was a noise, there was an atmosphere, a smell of Castrolar and so on. And I knew instantly at that time I wanted to spend my life in this environment and I wanted to race motor cars. Uh, my father being a press photographer and my brother being a press photographer, it was deemed that I should be a, a press photographer as well. So I started when I left school at 16 um, to be an apprentice in Fleet Street and I went through the dark room and printing and glazing and then going on jobs with photographers a, as an apprentice. But my yearning was still this eureka moment from Brands Hatch. I needed to get close to motor racing. So I left and I got a job at the Checkered Flag. And I met Jim Clark and Jackie Stewart and who drove for the Checkered Flag in Lotus Elands. This passion was getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And things didn't go particularly well with the, the, the checker flag. I couldn't see where I was going to get. I wanted to get close to international motor racing. I managed to cut a very long story short to get a job with the Firestone European race tyre division at Brentford. They were making race tyres for Ferrari, for um, Surtees, for Lotus, and it was a dream job for me. I was operations manager, so I was linking production to organising the trucks to go to all the Grand Prix and all the World Sports Car Championship races. And if they were short, I went to some of the races, like the Targa Florio, Le Mans, uh, Montlhery, 1000 Ks. I went down to Australia as a tyre engineer, taking tyre temperatures and giving advice to, um, to drivers and uh, the engineers. So. It, I was very much in the environment that I wanted to be in, but I wanted to be behind the wheel, not behind a, a tyre. In about 1964, I became a member of the 750 Motor Club, and they held meetings in Battersea, in uh, the upstairs room of a pub in Battersea. And people were going there, like Eric Broadley from Lola, who was building 1172 specials in the early 60s. And I was meeting these wonderful people, and I met a man called Lou Bergonzi. Lou Bergonzi had a little car called a DRW, and he wanted to sell it. Now, I had a bicycle. <laughs> um, actually, I, I, I had moved up to a motorbike then. Um, and I was so wanting to buy this racing car. It was 280 pounds, including the trailer. Eventually, my mother, bless her heart, said she would stand guarantor for a loan. I'd started working in clubs and bars in the evenings to save money and um, I managed to get a deposit together. I managed to borrow the money and Lou Bergonzi delivered the car to our flat in Chiswick on a very dank, cold November evening in 1974. And there I was, I had a racing car on a trailer but nothing else. I hadn't really thought things through. Uh, it sat there for a number of months while I saved money to try and enter a, an event. I did test the car at Silverstone and it was the most wonderful time, the most wonderful time I spent with my father working on this car together with him and we became the best of friends and it was the best time of my life. 
Eventually, in May 1965, we fitted a tow hitch to the back of my mum's Morris Minor 1000. We went to Snetterton for a round of the 11, 750 Motor Club 1172 formula. And we had to leave the day before because the poor old Morris Minor wouldn't tow it more than about 25 miles an hour with the toolbox in the back and the car and the trailer. So we drove all the way through the night and we got to Snetterton. So I was really nervous. We went out for practice and I went round and round and I had no idea about lines or, or anything. I was just having the best time of my life in this little car. And there were cars all around me and it just seemed such, such wonderful fun. Um, the achievement of an ambition. I was going to race a motor car for the first time. The flag dropped. I gave it some revs and I dropped the clutch and down towards the first corner I couldn't see anybody else in front of me. I'd gone through some people and I was in the lead and I, I looked round. I don't know why I didn't look in the rearview mirror but I looked round see, and there was all, all these cars and so I put the brakes on and of course I got overtaken left and right and centre. Uh, but eventually during the race uh, I managed to finish third and it was the drug had f had really taken me by then and so we got home and I had this wonderful egg cup size trophy which I still have in this room somewhere. I then saved more money by going doing more work and into my next race which was at Silverstone another 1172 formula race and I finished second. The third race I did was again at Silverstone. I knew what to do to sign on to scrutineer. I went out for practice I did the race and uh, I managed to win that one. And it's been downhill ever since. Really. <laughs> With the, the lack of money, I did a race every time I could afford it. So throughout the whole year I did seven races. At the end of the year we were invited, and I don't know why we were invited, well, I, I found out eventually, the 750 Motor Club um, said you must come to our annual dinner. Um, oh, okay. So my mother, my father and I went to the dinner and we were sitting there. People were going up, who people who'd won championships, uh, who came second, who came third. And then suddenly I heard my name and bless their hearts, they had a trophy called the Mike Air Trophy for the best newcomer to motor racing for the season, uh, which they gave to me, which I was very chuffed about. We said, right, we will do this again in 1966. And it went very sour, sadly. The first race I did was at Brands Hatch in 1966. And I was dicing at the front end of the fir first race uh, with a man called Pete Lokeman in a Rego. And uh, I thought I could get by him. So I was putting on a lot of pressure and as we went into Paddock Bend on one of the laps, um, he lost control of the car and started to spin. Now being quite inexperienced, when the car initially went sideways, I thought, that's great, he's going to spin to the infield. So I just kept flat out. But what happened was he, he held the slide and as I went past, he came backwards, tapped me off onto the grass on the outside of Paddock Bend. So as I got onto the grass, the ditch was pulling me in and I couldn't get it the car away. And it hit and it's, it somersaulted and of course we weren't wearing seat belts in those days. And uh, gave me a lovely broken nose uh, as I went into the dashboard. But that was good in a way because it, it knocked me out uh, totally, but also turned the petrol pump and the ignition switches off and uh, as it was inverted, I half fell out, which snapped my pelvis um, and uh, broke my wrist and uh, all my ribs. And I didn't wake up for about a week. The wonderful thing about my father and my mother, I was in Dartford Hospital, I couldn't be moved. And I was there for many months. And from my hospital bed, looking across the ward, I could see a particular spot in the car park in the hospital. And my father, with friends from the 750 Motor Club, stripped the car, started to rebuild the space frame chassis, and 
would tow it about once a fortnight to that particular spot in the car park so I could see how my race car was being rebuilt. Uh, and it, I mean, wonderful to, to tow it all the way from West London, all the way to Dartford in Kent, just to show me and then take it back and continue the work was, was fantastic. I had to sell the DRW once, we'd rebuilt it. Uh, I had to sell it to pay off all the debts that I had. Uh, so I came out even, so I didn't have a car. And I met a man called um, John Cavill. Uh, John lived in Aylesbury. His father was um, a developer and had built lots of houses in Aylesbury and they were doing very well. And John was racing in Formula Four. I managed to talk to people and just say, please, can I have a drive in your car, please? And lots of no's, lots of no's. Eventually, somebody said yes. Uh, it was two guys, a guy called Patrick Longhurst and um, Bob Jarvis. They ran little cars called Formula Fours. They were single-seaters with Hillman imp engines. And they were brilliant little cars. And they very kindly let me race one of their cars. I got very excited in a race at Ingleston where I was uh, running second to Bob Jarvis, who was leading, totally forgetting that he actually owned the car I was driving. I was so keen to win the money so I could afford to get home. Um, um, totally uh, unlike me, I just happened to tap him slightly into the last corner. It was a wet race. He slid wide, I went through and won got my money to travel home, but sadly he took the car off me afterwards, so I lost the drive. But John Cavill came up to me at Mallory Park in an, uh, when I was actually driving for these two guys and asked me where I braked and changed down for a particular corner called Gerrard's at Mallory Park. And I said, you brake and change down? Oh yes, I'd just like to do it maybe a little closer. I said, well, I'm doing it flat in top. I don't brake, I don't back off, I just, the cars will do it. Because they were only little imp engines, they weren't going incredibly quickly. So you didn't back off, you just went flat out. He went and spoke to his dad <coughs> and said uh, that really, I'm not going to be a racing driver. Mike just told me what he's doing. Why don't we try and help him? Uh, so they very kindly bought me a Formula 3 car. But we had to come up with the running costs. And I'd spoken to a man when I was trying to scrounge drives called Jeremy Sumner. He had a Chevron B8, which I'd never driven anything like it before. But Jeremy's car really changed my life. I did something called the Royal Tunbridge Wells Trophy Race at Brands Hatch. It was a Formula Libra race. Jeremy did the GT race and he said, you can do the Libra race. He said, you won't stand a chance because you're in with Formula 2s and Formula 3s, all single seaters. You will be the only GT car. Um, thank God it rained. And for some reason, I still, to this day, adore racing in the wet. I'm really quick for some reason in the wet. So I won this Royal Tunbridge Wells Trophy race in the Chevron and he said, we've got to try and help you. And I said, well, I've got this Formula 3 car, but we haven't got any running costs yet. He introduced me to some friends and they all got together and uh, said that they would provide the, I think it was about 30,000 pounds to do the British and the European Formula 3 championship. However, the catch was, I had a lovely job with Firestone, traveling the world, doing very well. I was married now and uh, I had, they said I had to give up work and be a professional racing driver. So they employed me as a driver for their company, a van driver basically, but I didn't drive vans, I drove the racing car. Uh, two years in Formula 3, I finished I think third in the British, one of the British Formula 3 championships. And they were called Dempster Developments. Uh, they wanted to race in this country because their companies were in the UK. So it was decided we'd do Formula 5000. So they bought a March 741 without an engine, fitted a Chevrolet V8 in the back, and we went Formula 5000 racing, which 
was another total eye-opener from a 120 brake horsepower Formula 3 to a 500 horsepower single-seater with a big cast iron block in the back and didn't handle particularly well. They were meeting machines, you know, proper guys racing cars really. I got a, a dreadful start in the race because I put it in first gear. Well, that's what you do, isn't it, in drive away. But these things had so much power, I just got swamped. And they were, my heroes were in this race, Brian Redman, Peter Gethin, David Hobbs, Teddy Pellett. So I learned so much from Brian Redman, I'd be overtaking him all in the wrong place, he'd just drive past me again. And uh, It was a long race, and eventually I beat Brian, and I came second to Peter Gethin. And I finished uh, in the top three in the next couple of races, and I was leading the European Championship. I had a phone call from Max Mosley at March, say, so, great, you're going so well. This was in May um, 1974. Hans Stuck had broken his wrist in, a form in the Grand Prix at Monaco. Would I stand in for him at the Swedish Grand Prix in two weeks' time? How cool is that? Yes, I'm going to get into Formula One. In between, the weekend in between, I had a Formula 5000 race at Thruxton and going quite well, running second or third, uh, overtaking a back marker. For some reason, he moved over on me, hit my back wheel, and I broke my wrist. And so I lost my chance. I think they put Ronnie Beeson in the car. But the seed was sown. My whole being was to uh, go to uh, Formula One. Dempster very kindly said that they would try and help me get to Formula One. They spoke to Mo Nunn and I, the car, the MN174 wasn't the best Formula One car in the world. We tried some different things with the, the, with the Ensign. It had this strange lack of fuel pressure in left hand corners where the engine would misfire a little bit. Uh, and when it was all so competitive that meant really that I was bashing my head against a brick wall. So. We changed the fuel system before Watkins Glen in October 1974 and the car didn't lose fuel pressure and I qualified for, my, for the American Grand Prix in front of people like Hans Stuck, um, Graham Hill, uh, Tim Schenken in the works, Lotus. So I was actually going pretty well. Uh, I remember qualifying was quite a funny story. I set off and I was struggling a little bit. I think I was lacking confidence and I was struggling a little bit and I thought, right, this, this will be, I'll do a warm up lap, we've got a new set of tyres on, this will be my lap. And as I set on to my lap, I looked in the mirror and Jody Schechter in the works, Tyrrell, was behind me. and. Jody's quite an aggressive character. <laughs> and I thought, well, I'm not going to let him by. I'm just going to, I've got my head down. This is going to be my lap. And I got my head down and I drove that car as hard as I possibly could. And I qualified 22nd out of 25. Okay, not brilliant, but we were on the grid and not that far off the front times, really. The whole grid was covered by two seconds. After practice, I went and had a shower and got changed and Ken Tyrrell came up to me and said, oh, uh, Jody's looking for you, can you go and have a chat? And I thought, I know what he's going to say. I just know he's going to say, why didn't you get out of my way? And I thought, no, I'm here on merit. So I, I was in an aggressive mood when I went down to the garage to see Jody. He was talking to somebody, so I waited patiently, boiling inside that I thought he was going to have a go at me. and. When he stopped talking, I went up to him and got my finger and I put it in his chest. Do you want to talk to me? Uh, and he looked a little bit aghast. And he said, oh, yes, uh, Mike. He said, I just wanted to tell you how fantastically well you were making that old ensign go. And I felt about that big, but it, was, it made me laugh. So having done my first Grand Prix at Watkins Glen, I then signed for BRM uh, the following year. Uh, I was dicing with Chris Amon at one stage during the um, American Grand Prix. He was driving for BRM in a P201. 
he was leaving the team after that race and uh, Louis Stanley phoned me and I subsequently signed to do the Argentinian Brazilian Grand Prix and supposedly the rest of the year but the, the car kept breaking down, I got frustrated, he didn't like that so I got fired after two races and I never got back into Formula One sadly but at least I'd got and achieved that ambition. I then concentrated on sports cars and uh, I drove for a Curia Cos in Group C for four years. We won the World Championship in 1986 and I suppose a bit of a journeyman race driver after that. I did British Formula One, I won the British Formula Two Championship um, involved in that uh, series, uh, won various championships in touring cars, uh, British Endurance uh, Championships. Uh, won two or three of those. 2016, one Brit car in a, in a Ferrari 458. I'm 72 now, but I can't get rid of that passion for motor racing. I still want to motor race. Uh, but I have to say, <laughs> the racing opportunities are getting a little few and far between now. But uh, I, sp I love being at racetracks. I'm at home at racetracks. I'm at home with racing people. So I do a lot of coaching now. Uh, I teach on track days, people who want to drive their supercars um, a little quicker. I coach racing drivers who want to go quicker. Uh, I absolutely adore teaching. I did actually at one stage during my career of, of motor racing become a helicopter instructor because I love to fly. Uh, that I don't really do anymore, but I can't see me giving up coaching uh, in cars on track. I, I just love it. Uh, I love sports cars. All the way back from the chequered flag I love sports cars and there were two cars that I always wanted to own. Thank you all very much for watching. To see the second part of this film with Mike where he talks about his E-Type and his cherished 911 Club Sport and where I get to drive both, please click on this link.